Welcome to Nurse Practitioners Changing Practice. And we are joined today by Dr. Els Buffard. And we are just so excited to have you with us today. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. Els Buffard, tell us a little bit about um, your journey um, and deciding you're a woman's health nurse practitioner, right? And you decided to go back to get your doctorate. Why did you do that? Uh, good evening and thank you for having me. Um, I am in a medical field from 1990. I start my journey in a medical field as a, a midwife. Um, I'm originally from uh, Iran and uh, uh, I went uh, to pre-med uh, medical school and then uh, I went to the midwifery school. So I did my um, grad school in a midwifery. I had a office for 10 years and then I moved to United States in 1997. Um, when I got here, the nurse midwifery was uh, the route for here. So I decided to go back to the nursing school. I started the nursing school for my uh, ASN and the bachelor degree. And when I wanted to do the nurse midwifery, the model that they are using here was different. So I decided the women health nurse practitioner is a better route for me. Um, so um, right away, I went to my master program. I graduated in 2004 from Seton Hall University in the South Orange, New Jersey. And um, since that time, um, I did a lot with women health. Um, I was a director of the women health services. Then I was a manager of the labor and delivery, mother and baby, and level one nursery. Um, then um, I started to uh, expand and I was thinking, okay, I need to learn different things. So um, I went to the hospitalist role and then even I went to cardiology and I was a, a, a congestive heart failure nurse practitioner. I worked with the heart failure patients and now I'm back in a hospital. Um, I did a short period of time teaching when I was in Philadelphia uh, in three different nursing school. And when I was there, um, I got the scholarship for Rutgers, Hus uh, the Rutgers University to uh, do the nursing researcher. I worked with Dr. Jones as assistant um, research uh, assistant actually for a short period of time and one semester. My kids were young and uh, they were asking me to stop school in just uh, until they finished the high school. So I decided to stop my doctorate. And then uh, that time the doctorate of nursing practice was not exist. We only had a, a PhD in a nursing. Um, uh -huh. When the DMP started, I was thinking, oh, this is a better route for me because I always love the practice. And I thought that is a better bridge between uh, the practice, research, and education together. So always my goal was to teach, to go back and teach in a nursing school again while I'm doing uh, my cl uh, clinical practice and do the research. Um, during the journey of the research in Maryville, we started with heart failure, that which always was a dear subject to me. And then um, for some limitation that when you start uh, your research, um, a lot of elements is important. One of them is um, the hospital that you do the research, if they let you to do the research, if they are affiliated with the school or not, which is something that you have to consider it when you are deciding your research topic. Um, then I went to I the- stumbled upon this, this, uh this topic, didn't you? Because I, I think that that journey in the hospital didn't quite work out, but actually that was to your advantage because um, you became uh, acquainted with another doctor in his practice and you went back into that first role of your life, uh, which was women's health. And what did yeah. you discover there? Uh, it was interesting because for a while I was uh, out from the women um, health. Uh, when we had a patient, I try always to do the teaching with them because I was familiar with the subject. But then the research completely take me by surprise and I went back to the women health. And when I was talking with uh, one of the colleagues um, that what do you think that going on in your practice that you need the research to be done, how I can help. Mm -hmm. And then he brought in that um, he has a 
large population of the women in, a, in like a menopausal age and they sometimes they ask him question and he doesn't really know how to treat the menopause symptoms. So that journey took me to, uh, that question actually took me to the journey of uh, the looking at genital urinary sy syndrome of menopause. And uh, which we know as atrophic vaginitis. I mean, yeah. I'm an older nurse practitioner and I mean, it was just always, but I think it was so interesting to determine working uh, with you and watching your project unfold um, was how many women didn't associate all of the symptoms they were having with menopause and how inadequate the physician felt in really being able to deal with it. Uh, absolutely. It was amazing to see even uh, when I went back to the hospital and I, everybody was asking me what research I'm doing and I was talking with them, even my other physician colleagues, it was interested to them. They said, oh, okay, uh, we didn't think about it or what options you have. So it, it was an interesting topic and then I find out it's not too many um, Physicians are familiar with the subject. Um, part of it is not they don't get enough training and education during their internship or residency unless you are at OBGYN that uh, you are completely trained in that subject. So it's a little bit of strange training for the internal medicine family physician. And it's opened up more journey for me because I'm talking with the different physician and uh, I was asking if I can help them in a women health, like because now I'm a family nurse practitioner, I can work with them and yeah. they like to, uh, to refer their patient, uh, the women to me, so I can see them, I work with them, which is an exciting um, uh, practice for me, especially now Florida law is changed, we had the autonomous practice from February of 2000. Yay! One. So you then, are autonomous now? Yes, actually, I was the first series. I exactly apply in February of, uh, 20, I think it was February 21st, 2020. Um, so I just applied for it and I got it. Um, so I, you don't need any type of collaborative agreement at all? I, I don't think so because uh, now my, uh, my license changed as an autonomous practitioner. Uh -huh. but, um, I work in a hospital. Still, I'm um, seeing to see how everything is working because I know that two new law is goes for legislation, which one of them is about uh, supervision of the physician in the state of Florida. So I think it's still from the insurance. There's company. still a little something going on. Yes. So now some of the things with atrophic vaginitis are genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Specifically, um, women have, uh, I noticed myself as a practitioner that a lot of older women would come in with repeat urinary tract infections and they would treat the urinary tract infection without looking at the underlying cause, which most of the time ended up being genitourinary syndrome. They had atrophic vaginitis, they had very thin vaginal walls, um, they had stress incontinence because that tissue wasn't as strong and they would get a repeat urinary tract infections right about the age of, of menopause. So I think that's a bigger problem than we, we realize, especially with our repeat UTI uh, people in, in an older uh, population. Uh, what, what is the recommended treatment for that? Uh, usually they are using uh of uh, the like a cream the topical estrogen. estrogens yeah or the estrogen ring or something like that now what are the dangers of that with like let's say somebody who might have a history of breast cancer um it's a lot of research was done actually doesn't have that much a risk that they thought in the beginning they have because it's not a systemic steroids in the right. um, So it actually, it's a very good topic for research to be done in like a long-term facility or the hospitals because uh -huh. we're getting a lot of residents of skilled nursing facility that we see them 
uh, in a hospital, even people working in an emergency room, we get a lot of urinary tract infection. And even when I talk now with my patients, I was telling them that, you know, that if you are using this one, probably the risk will be uh, much less. And I did the research about it. So they are looking at me and say, oh, nobody told me this. Yeah, I so, think there's a lot of lack of knowledge on physicians being, um, or any provider really being hesitant on prescribing estrogen cream if there's any chance of cancer, lack of education from patients because they hear the word estrogen and they get scared. Um, but this is a topical cream and it does quite a bit. It actually helps with uh, stress incontinence. Yeah. It helps with, um, which I'm getting at that age, I'm becoming acquainted with that, you know, it's, and, you know, I, I can relate now to some of these symptoms, you know, and um, I haven't started getting more urinary tract infections, but I could see where that could happen if, if a just you didn't do anything about it. And then there's sexual dysfunction as well, too. I mean, that was something I don't think women really equated to menopause. You think of hot flashes, you think of maybe the urinary tract infections, but there's a lot of uh, pain or discomfort then with sexual um, activity. And, and this addresses that as well, right? Yes, the dysphoronia actually is the biggest um, issue too. And a lot of uh, females, in this age, they think that, okay, so part of natural aging. So a lot of them, they don't ask for it. Um, it's, they are suffer in a silence uh, and it can make a big difference for them if somebody asks really the question. Because we don't ask the question, they are not bringing up the question. So right. answer it. Um, part of our um, health system is we are spending um, less and less time with the patient, unfortunately, because everything is computerized. We are kind of losing that touch with our patient, which the nurse practitioners can be the biggest help because we can emphasize more in a teaching um, and spending time with the patient because of our nursing aspect of it, that which the medical uh, physician, the don't have that aspect of it. So we can look at the whole body systems in uh -huh. just work through the mind and body. And uh, that teaching can make actually a lot of difference. And if we are opening up, I, I believe in a lot of like internal medicine family um, uh, clinics, we can make a difference in uh, women health. And it's a topic that they are not that much work on it. So the dysphoronia, the urinary tract infection, all these symptoms and syndromes can make a big Im uh, impact in the sexual function of the female and their satisfaction. A lot of even research was done about a degree of sexual satisfaction that the women have, which is health for their longevity too. Um, so I, I, I believe I mean, there's a lot of a stress reduction benefit fit all kinds of things just having your body function the way it should and and I can see the hesitancy and you know just going up and talking to a provider and saying look I'm having these issues especially when you don't even know that they're related to menopause and there's a treatment yep. for it now tell us a little bit now you did a lot of research on the different ways to screen women for the genito uh, urinary symptoms as part of your project and so you looked at a lot of tools. Some of them were very long, lengthy kind of tools that had a little more reliability, but you settled on one that hadn't been as well researched, but was very simple to use. So tell us a little bit about this tool, how you found it and how you, how you found using it in this environment worked. Um, yeah, it, it, different, um, different surveys was done, the, the questionnaires, which uh, they are more reliable and the validity is already tested, but they are very lengthy. Some of them is like three, four pages, uh, which Harvard has one of them. Um, and when we look at it, even uh, when I talk with the physician that I was running the research in his office, he was looking at it and I said, ah, it's three, four pages. I don't believe that the patient is there's going There's not enough time. Yeah, there's not enough time. But what did you find unique about this particular tool? And was it, uh, I do believe, uh, tell us a little bit about your results. How accurate did you find it to be? Sure. Um, I find Dr. Susan Goldstein, uh, she is a Canadian uh, OBGYN and she is one of the educator uh, 
in uh, Toronto University, she used this uh, questionnaire, which she simplified it. It's only five questions. Uh, and if you answer yes to four of them, it just already put you in a category that- Is it like one of four, any one of the yeah. four, you would yes, put you at risk? Four, yes, any of yeah. the first four, it just gets you yes, and it just gave you the positive finding. When we look at the categories, we saw that um, it make a lot of difference. The five question maybe doesn't take more than two minutes. It's very simple in a, at fifth grade level um, education. It's simple to ask even for so the didn't, didn't wasn't intrusive in the practice, kind of easily went through with an easy intake. So then your physician would, would see the score and that would give them uh, the alert that maybe they could probe a little more, ask for more information to see if indeed there really was um, something to the problem. This. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then we saw that uh, it, some of the categories is completely, the number was phenomenal. Like they didn't um, catch that much uh, like um, something for like insomnia and um, I believe one other category. Mood disorder, I think, was the yeah, other. Yeah, the mood disorder, you're right. Uh, that too was not really showing. No, that didn't, either one of those didn't, but some of the other ones did. But um, the hot flashes, uh, the dyspareunia, the urinary tract infection and all the stuff, it, it shows a big difference. Like we captured so many patients that before was not even mentioned. So it can make a big impact if uh, with the simple question that it only takes two minutes, uh, we already identify these patients and then we can look at, okay, what is our options? Are we are going to do like uh, uh, hormonal therapy or we are going to do the estrogen as a, like a topical or we are going topical, to yeah well depending on their yes. their symptoms you could you could tease it out more and I would think since this is a very simple five or six questions it could be built into the EHR yes just very very easily that's one of the uh, actually improvement I saw the, in a clinic because um, um, that was the discussion I had with the, with the physician. Sometimes um, it's it's a bigger part for the practitioner or the medical assistant to put this one in a questionnaire. But if it's a part of the EMR, um, it's the tools that- It's just are like five or six questions. And you're just doing it during the well woman visit. So these would be natural, normal questions you would ask during a well woman visit that wouldn't be out of the ordinary or anything like that. So, um, so tell us then just to kind of wrap this up, what are your future plans? How are you gonna, uh, I mean, you've obviously changed practice. Um, I, I assume that this physician is pleased and he's gonna continue to incorporate this screening and you're going to be, um, you know, reaching more and more women who suffer from this so that we can get them treated. Um, what are your future plans on your research? What are you, where are you going to go from here? Uh, when I started, because that was a phase one, so I always wanted to do the phase two and see, okay, now we identify this patients, what we are going to do with them and what changes we are going to make and how we can implement it for more than one clinic that I work with it. So that's my goal. So that'll be your next study, right? Yes. You'll see if you can identify. And I would really think that if you can get that questionnaire built into that EHR and then kind of a, you can follow it then and see, well, okay, who was identified and who, who received treatment and then what kind of treatment did they choose? And then follow that patient to find out if it made a difference in their life. That'd be a great study, great paper. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think uh, this part of project like Vivian Health is very, uh, not well, maybe a research. This can make a difference, especially with the aging of the, uh, the baby boomers that we're getting all to the age. Oh, we are. <laughs> so we are going to have more and more. Uh, even when you talk with the colleagues, it, it's an interesting thing. Even with my friends, they, they said, oh, when you open the practice, we will be part of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll be yeah. a part of your study. 
Yeah, because uh, nobody asked them the question as a, and a female in that age, they said, oh, and they never asked me this. Yes, I have the symptoms. So a lot of times when you talk with them, they open up and you will see a lot of people suffer of these symptoms, which because not asked, they don't know it or they didn't know that even they, ha they can ask this question and they have a treatment for it, which is nice to know we can make a difference. Well, and on the other hand, too, educating uh, providers that this does exist, that it really is a lot more prevalent than we realize. It really does. It, I mean, just even in, from the UTI standpoint of it, there are so many older women admitted to the hospital. You as a hospitalist see urosepsis all the time, and it takes people's lives. So if we have a simpler treatment that we can get it, nip it in the bud to where we don't have as many urinary tract infections, just think of that alone as to how much that would decrease cost, medical costs and complications. So that, that makes it worth it for hospitals to research this more, for private practices that, that deal with women's health in any way to, and I really like how you pointed out that, you know, as an NP, we can really spend the time that we need to to talk to them and, and really get to know that patient and know all of the things that are going on in their life so that we can identify some of these issues and um, get them get them pointed in the right direction so they can start making uh, progress in it. Well, Mandy, I can't thank you enough, or Dr. Alba Rez, uh, for being a part of our, um, our podcast. Uh, we are hoping to inspire. Uh, what, what would be your last words of wisdom to, to students who are thinking about being an NP or going into being a DNP? Um, I think uh, more doctorate level nurse practitioner is needed. We can make a difference. Um, we can difference in a uh, we can make a difference in a practice. We can educate our colleagues. We can educate uh, the patients that we are work um, as much as we are uh, better in our practice. And in a doctorate level, you are more um, more able to do this changes in a legislative uh, level if you wanted to be in that one in an educational level and in a practice. So. Um, my advice to my colleagues is uh, this is the last point that we can go even um, you can go higher than this if you want it uh, we have too many certification that we can go <laughs> to, to you can go stay going for practice. certifications yeah. forever <laughs> yes. yeah. um, but I believe uh, having your doctorate is make a difference so I, I think you're right. I think that um, we all need to aspire to go as high as we can and to get the research behind us so that we can make a difference in different areas that we're interested in. Um, and I will look forward to um, booking you later, six months or so from now, to see all the wonderful things you've done and see if phase two has got started. Um, and we just really, really appreciate you taking your time uh, to be with us tonight and to inspire our um, young and upcoming NPs and encourage our NPs that are already in practice to go just that extra mile and get their doctorate. Um, so I thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. And in the end, I wanted to thank Dr. Carol Berger. She is my department chair and uh, she was very influential to me. Um, uh, looking up to her, uh, she is my exemplary uh, nurse practitioner. So um, I'm thanking her too. She was all the way with me in this. Oh, thank you. We really appreciate it. Well, you you are one of the stars, and you're rising. So I can't wait to follow all of your research and and that's all we have for tonight. But we thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Good luck to everybody. Bye. I think.